Breathing and empty nose syndrome, it's a controversial condition and it was coined by the Mayo Clinic's Dr. Eugene Cairn back in 1994. It's the presence of paradoxical nasal obstruction despite an objectively wide patent nasal cavity. In other words, upon examination, the patient seems to have an adequate nasal cavity, that there should be no problem with air moving from the nose into the lungs. But yet, the patient is, is complaining that they're not getting enough air, that they feel that their nose is stuffy. Turbinates within the nose are soft structures which condition the air before entering the lungs. For example, during cold weather, the turbinates will swell. During dry weather, they secrete more moisture. In this scan that we're looking at, the air spaces surrounding the turbinates are healthy. There's a two to three millimeter space for air to flow freely. Nasal resistance is important in enhancing alveolar ventilation, in the exchange of gas from the lungs to the blood and improves gas exchange. So nasal resistance, the nose naturally imposes a resistance to breathing that's two to three times that of the mouth. It slows down the breath. The air is flowing slowly into the lungs and remaining long enough in the lungs for gas exchange to take place. Nasal resistance during expiration helps to maintain lung volumes and may indirectly affect arterial oxygenation. So if there is surgical reduction to the turbinates, even if the turbinates are reduced by only 10%, Air flows too freely and dries out the mucus. The nasal mucosa attempt to swell and secrete more mucus. This increased fluid drips and drains into the throat. The patient experiences the swelling even though air is moving freely. And as the patient is experiencing swelling, they feel that their nose is congested. So despite having an adequate airway, in actual fact, they have so much space in the nose, but that is the problem. The patient complains that they cannot feel the air moving through the nose. They have nasal dryness. They feel suffocated. They're in a constant state of dyspnea or breathlessness. This can contribute to panic, insomnia, fatigue, anxiety, depression, and even suicide. For example, Michael Jackson's cause of insomnia may have been down to empty nose syndrome. The diagnosis of empty nose syndrome is difficult as there are no reliable objective tests. Thus, the diagnosis relies on the patient's subjective symptoms. Patients with empty nose syndrome following turbinate reduction surgery, they often complain of breathing difficulties. In this study, researchers are investigating a group of patients who are presenting with difficulty in breathing post turbinate surgery. They complete the Nijmegen questionnaire, which is a validated questionnaire for the diagnosis of hyperventilation syndrome. They also do the hyperventilation provocation test. This is whereby the patient breathes hard for a period of one to three minutes to reproduce the symptoms that they are experiencing. Hyperventilation was also defined by a delayed return to end tidal partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the expired gas to baseline during the hyperventilation provocation test. In other words, when the patient was doing the hyperventilation provocation test, this would lead to a reduction of arterial CO2. And the researchers were investigating how long was it taking for low carbon dioxide as a result of hyperventilation to return back to baseline. A delayed response would be indicative of hyperventilation syndrome. Hyperventilation syndrome was diagnosed in 17 out of these 29 patients, 77%. And the study suggested hyperventilation syndrome is frequent in patients with empty nose syndrome, and that symptoms can be improved by respiratory rehabilitation. In other words, by normalizing breathing volume, by bringing breathing volume down towards normal, by reducing the respiratory rate, by reducing tidal volume, by reducing minute ventilation. The pathophysiological links between empty nose syndrome and hyperventilation syndrome deserve to be further explored.